Um, Um, and then you're, you have an option of updating your name in Zoom to include your preferred name and pronouns. And there is a series of images that show you how to do that if you choose. So welcome, my name is Hannah. I am an active trans transportation planner with the Boston Transportation Department. And the other folks on this project team are Dan Marrow, who's an engineer, and Stephanie Seskin, who is the Active Transportation Director. Tonight, we're going to review the draft plan for all of the blue streets that you see on this map. And um, we're going to talk about all the different changes that we are proposing as part of this plan and how it has evolved in response to your feedback and support and then talk about next steps. So thank you to everyone who has had a conversation with us um, through many different ways, pop-ups at parks in 2020, virtual meetings and phone calls. Um, we've collected and really um, reviewed all of your concerns and tried our best to look into solutions that are street design changes to solve them. This project started in fall of 2020 and started by surveying and listening to your safety concerns. And then in spring 2021, we shared initial iterations of design ideas. And then where we are right now um, is that we're still sharing the second iterations of those designs in response to all the feedback that we received. The project area, um, so all of the streets that are part of neighborhood, neighborhood slow street zones projects are smaller streets, neighborhood streets, or known as side streets. So for your neighborhood, this includes all of these streets in blue. So um, the, I'm not going to read all of these streets out loud right now, but for those of you in the phone, on the phone, um, it's the side streets that are uh, in between Dudley Street, Blue Hill Avenue, Waverly Street, and Warren Street. So at its core, what a neighborhood slow street zone means are speed limit changes. So all of the streets within the zone will have a target 20 mile per hour speed limit change. And gateway signage. So I have on this uh, up on the screen, I have an image of speed limit signs and then 20 mile per hour pavement markings. So for example, when someone is entering the zone from Dudley Street, they will see these signage, signage and know that they are in a slow zone. And then another design philosophy is core philosophy is using street design tools to actually make street design changes that self enforce that slower speed limit. An example of one of those tools are raised crosswalks, which are the same level as the sidewalk. Curb extensions, which are known as bump outs, which um, bump out the, the curb or the sidewalk just at the crosswalk um, and extends into the street approximately six feet or less than the width of most park cars. We also install speed humps, which are very popular and effective in slowing speeds to that 20, 25 miles per hour. And we aim to place them about 150 to 250 feet apart in order to dis achieve this goal speed. Speed humps are not speed bumps which you might see in a parking lot, for example, they're pretty gradual. And then at its highest are three inches above the ground. 
they don't impact street parking or drainage or snow removal or um, street sweeping. We don't install them on roads that are too curvy or too hilly um, and then always avoid placing them right in front of driveways. So here is a bit in this nutshell on the screen, um, the criteria, design criteria for speed humps. So the streets that we're considering for speed humps in this zone, so we've shared this map before, um, and I'm just gonna read out uh, these streets. So the, it involves Greenville Street, um, Winthrop Street, Cleveland Street, Moreland Street, Whiting Street, Montrose Street, Dunreath, Copeland, Aspen, Perrin, Alaska, Waverly, Fairlyn, Mount Pleasant Avenue, Vine, and Forest. So I just read those out for the folks on the phone. Um, another street design tool are clear corners. So sometimes we can achieve clear corners or clear sight lines in front of crosswalks um, with these white poles and um, white box pavement markings that form a box. Um, and basically it pushes parking a little bit further from an intersection so that when a driver is approaching a crosswalk, they are better able to see what's in front of them. So whether that's another car turning onto that street or some children who are about to cross the street, they can be better prepared. So aside from speed homes um, and all the streets that I just mentioned where we plan to install them, we also focus on installing or uh, designing safer crosswalks. And so some of the focused areas where we are designing safer crosswalks um, include Mount Pleasant Avenue at Forest Street on both ends, so the east side and the west side of Mount Pleasant Avenue and Forest. Mount Pleasant Avenue at the play area, Moreland Street at the Gertrude House Playground, and then Copeland Street and Dunreath Street um, near the entrance to Little Scobie. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to go through each of these focus areas and some of them, if you've been part of our discussions before, we've gone through, um, but I'm just going to go through them really briefly so that we can talk about them at the end. So at Mount Pleasant Avenue, um, near the playground, we heard that there's speeding, that the crosswalks, um, well, crossing the street doesn't feel safe even though it's close to a public park um, because there aren't existing crosswalks. And then there's also a tree um, that creates sort of an, a, creates a poor visibility for anybody, blocks views, sight lines of, for, of people crossing the street to the playground. Um, and so our original idea um, or original iteration of this design solution was to install a raised crosswalk with curb extensions near the playground entrance, and then a curb extension and new crosswalk um, right before the street curves and turns toward the playground. And then in November of last year, we further refined this design. Um, so, um, the design on the screen, which shows a raised crosswalk and curb ex and new, new crosswalks and new accessible ramps across Mount Pleasant Terrace and Mount Pleasant Avenue um, was a design update. And so the, the, so we heard feedback that, um, that this was something that some people had 
some people were really interested in because the goal of this design is to not only create safer crosswalks, but also slow speeds for cars turning, um, making the turn um, on Mount Pleasant Avenue. So nothing really changed since November, 2021. A second focus area is Moreland Street near the Gertrude House Playground. We heard that people speed on Moreland Street and that crosswalks near the park just don't feel safe because of visibility issues at um, Fairland and Montrose. And also that cars sometimes don't stop for people who want to cross the street. So in March, 2021, we shared a couple different options. For Fairland, Montrose, and Moreland, we considered a raised intersection, raised intersection, which raises the intersection and all the crosswalks to the same level as the sidewalk, or this design um, that included curb extensions. And then for Moreland and Copeland, we considered a raised intersection um, or a raised crosswalk and a curb extension that would slow, um, slow cars as they make that turn from Moreland to Copeland. And we heard that uh, folks in the neighborhood wanted us to look at the raised intersection and felt that that was the best design and safest design option for these two important crossings. So, so that is what we're gonna propose. Um, so at Montrose, Fairland and Moreland, we're proposing to design a race intersection. And then at Copeland Street and Moreland Street, um, we're also proposing to design a raised intersection and a bump out at the corner of Copeland and Moreland to slow cars as they're turning onto Copeland Street. And we just wanted to add that these new designs would um, come with some uh, parking restrictions. So as I said, we, we wanna make sure that people can see people, uh, drivers can see people crossing the street. Um, and also that when you're crossing the street, you can see if there's an oncoming car. So we'll install, our plan is to install those white boxes and flex posts to push parking a little bit farther from the crosswalk. Okay. So um, um, a third, the third focus area is at Copeland Street and Little Scobie. Um, so we heard that there's, well, there's no existing crosswalk to the park and there's a curve in the street that creates a blind spot that makes it really hard to see people crossing. Um, so in March, 2021, we proposed to install a raised crosswalk, right, um, or as close as we could get it to the entrance to the park. So right before the street curves, our plan was to install a raised crosswalk. Um, and then we shared another iteration in November, 2021. And then we got the feedback that we want that folks in the neighborhood want us to look at different options or locations for this race crosswalk. So in, earlier this year in February, we shared three design options for a location for this new crosswalk on Copeland Street. Um, the two additional options were to place the crosswalk um, right after Langford Street and Copeland Street meet or right before where Langford Park and Copeland Street meets. And we heard the most support for the option to put the cro race crosswalk just after the intersection of Langford Street and Copeland Street. 
after the location of the fire hydrant. Um, just want to answer the uh, question in the chat, the dimensions of the white box, flex post boxes or clear corners boxes will, are about 20 feet. Okay, so another question that we had at the, our earlier meeting is, are we considering also a new crosswalk at on Dunry Street at the other side, other entrance to Little Scobie Playground? So we looked into this and tried to figure out what would be a good location for this new crosswalk that could still be visible from far away. So wouldn't be um, wouldn't be too far into the curve of the street so that someone driving or potion wouldn't be able to see someone crossing. So this, our design for a new uh, crosswalk on Dunry Street would be to design a raised crosswalk that's near 18th Dunry Street um, near the fire hydrant. And uh, the parking restrictions here would be that you wouldn't be able to park right on top of the crosswalk or um, next to the fire hydrant. So we would add those flex post boxes in front of the hyd fire hydrant, but it's an existing parking restriction area. So a second new focus area is looking at those cross crosswalks at Forest and Mount Pleasant. Um, so there's one interest. So at one end of Mount Pleasant, where Mount Pleasant Avenue meets Forest Street, there's a preschool. And um, we heard that it gets during the arrival, just busy arrival and dismissal hours. It feels dangerous. Kids are trying to cross the street and it, there isn't really a safe place to do that. So our plan in response to that is to add a new crosswalk um, across from Mount Pleasant Street, um, which and design a curb extension and add the clear corners boxes um, to create safe, safer crossings at Forest and Mount Pleasant. And then I'm showing on the screen an image of what these new parking restrictions would look like. So there would be a parking restriction right in front of 11 Mount Pleasant Avenue. Um, and then right in front of the crosswalk that goes across Forest Street. Okay. And so at the other end of Mount Pleasant Street at Forest Street, um, we're also asked to look at opportunities to create more safer crossings. So um, our plan is to add a new crosswalk that goes across Mount Pleasant Avenue um, and then add curb extensions um, near 22 Mount Pleasant Avenue, where the Blue Bag Station is, and um, on the other side. So these curb extensions also allow us to build accessible ramps because they provide us more space to build ramps that um, someone on a wheelchair would be able to navigate. So parking would be restricted by the new crosswalk, which is located near 143 Mount Pleasant Avenue. Um, and then it would also be restricted oh, between 
on Mount Pleasant Avenue where the Blue Bike Station is. Okay. All right, um, and so other, so in addition to safer crosswalks and slowing speeding with speed humps, we were also asked to look into street direction changes. So Perrin Street um, came up a lot in these discussions. And so the safety concerns here were that with parking on both sides, Perrin Street feels very narrow for two-way travel. Um, and there's a lot of speeding and that parent street is a cut through to Moreland Street. So there are several different options that we can do to address the, these safety concerns. So one is to turn, make all of Perrin Street one way, either toward Moreland or toward Waverly. Or we can keep the section between Waverly and Alaska two way and make Perrin Street one way from Alaska to Moreland or from Moreland to Alaska. Or we can make Parent Street one way, but from Alaska, from Alaska to Waverly, it is going direction southbound. And from Alaska to Moreland, it's the other direction, northbound. So I, I think um, we've heard, I've heard, um, feedback that a couple of these different options could be feasible or um, things that the neighborhood would want to pursue. And we can talk more about this at, um, after this presentation. Okay, so another area that we were asked to look into is Mount Pleasant Street. Um, sorry, this is actually between Fairland and Vine Street. So the safety concerns are that people are driving from Vine Street to get to Fairland and they're, when they're doing this, they're going the wrong way on Mount Pleasant Avenue for a very short while. And it's very un unexpected and feels dangerous um, and uh, just doesn't feel safe, especially when cars are going very fast. So some challenges to addressing this issue is that there aren't a lot of street design tools that are really effective in addressing wrong way driving or that kind of behavior. The street itself is narrow, um, which makes it an issue. We, we have to consider retaining street widths for fire and emergency access. So we can't do too much um, to further narrow the street with curb extensions or some street design tools. Um, then we also wanna be mindful to sensitivities about parking loss and um, maintaining or uh, street parking for an adequate number of street parking for people who need it. So some things that we can do are add speed humps, um, which we will add to both Mount Pleasant Avenue, Fairland Street and Vine Street. We could make Mount Pleasant Avenue between Fairland and Vine two ways. So legalize that movement, but add some street elements to make this safer. So I'm gonna show on the screen um, what this would look like if we were to uh, make this movement from Vine to Fairland legal, but a little bit more predictable and hopefully avoid head-on collisions. Um, and this is just an option. 
So we could add a double yellow line so that it's clear that it's a two-way travel. Um, this would mean restricting parking on both sides of the street between Fairland Street and Vine Street. So that would be a couple parking spots. Um, all right, so I'll get back to that um, at the end, but I definitely want to hear thoughts about that later. Um, so another issue area that we heard was uh, the intersection of Winthrop, Greenville, and Cleveland. And similar concerns about wrong way driving on Greenville, Cleveland, and Winthrop and people blowing through stop signs and people driving really fast. So here are some street design options that we can pursue and talk more about. So some of, some of the street direction changes we can make to make, you know, since we know that people are dry, making that movement to get from one place to another through the neighborhood. Um, we wanted to just share this, if this was an option to pursue additional street direction changes, for example, making Cleveland Street one way from Winthrop to Moreland, and then making Whiting Street Moreland to Winthrop Street, um, or reversing the street direction of Cleveland, Cleveland Street only, um, or we could, consider making Cleveland Street two-way or making Winthrop Street between Fairland Street and Cleveland Street two-way. So these are just a few options that we can consider and talk more about later. All right, I think that should be it. Um, so we will be having more events to talk about all of these street design changes um, later in later this summer and fall. Um, so please look out for those postcards which we've shared um, to folks in the neighborhood before. But just wanted to pause there and take questions since that was a lot of information that we shared. Um, yeah, Hannah, that was that was a lot. Um, could you start by um, going back to um, the proposals for crosswalks on Montrose Street? Yes. Um, can you put up the parking restriction graphic? Okay. Um, so a lot of the parking um, here is already um, restricted. So we're um, trying to minimize the amount that we add after that. Um, again, as Hannah said, we need to restrict parking on the crosswalks themselves um, and for a little bit in front of the crosswalks for oncoming traffic to better see people um, who are in the crosswalk trying to cross the street, whether they're children or people in wheelchairs. Um, so Dan, for this location, could you estimate the parking spaces that would be restricted in addition to the existing ones? Uh, here for these two locations between uh, both intersections, roughly six parking spaces would be lost in this particular area with the current design. Can I, then, can, I, can I just ask a question to, to remind you that you can only park on one side of the street? So you're saying three spaces at the beginning of Fairland on one side of the street, and then three spaces on Montrose Street at the beginning of the street. Anna, can you point to them? Uh, 
So there's one space on Fairland approaching Moreland. Um, two spaces on Moreland on the southern side are the, I don't actually know what direction we're looking at right now, but um, on either side of Montrose Street and one on Montrose Street um, approaching Moreland on the left-hand side. Um, so that's the first four. And then at Copeland, um, we have two more on Moreland Street um, in both sides of the intersection so that um, drivers on Moreland, no matter what direction they're going in, can see people as they're crossing the street. All right, thank you. Yeah, okay, so I see that there's a lot of questions about the street. Yeah, we also change. have some raised hands, so okay. can we just see, yeah, okay. Um, you also went through things very fast. So can we go back to Winthrop Street quickly? Thank you. Yep, go ahead. Um, the question was just, can you go back to Winthrop Street so he can actually look at it? Okay. Um, so I'll let you look at that and then we will um, start going through some of the raised hands. Um, all right, um, Cheryl. Yeah, um, on the Montrose Street, you're going to lose one. It's only parking on one side, the left hand side. It's a one way. It's a one way. So you're saying you're going to lose one spot on the corner of Montrose and Moreland on the Montrose side and one spot on the Moreland side, on that corner? Let me go back to that. And then one on Winthrop, because there's not parking on Moreland on that side. I mean, is it, what you're saying is the, this, the, the blue is where you're losing parking? No. Um, that is where... So the blue on the screen indicates where we're going to be, be rebuilding the sidewalk and the curb ramps. The red dotted line on the screen shows where parking would be restricted. It's like at the corner. Well, that's um, cool. Yeah, and at the crosswalks and then right before the crosswalk. So 20 feet is more than one car length, right? Um, I'm going to pass that to Dan or Stephanie. Uh, the average car is probably somewhere between 16 and 19 feet. Um, 20 feet is what we have to use when we determine what exactly a car length is for a spot because they do need space to pull in and out as well. And that is just um, our standard accepted length for a parking space of 20 feet. Certainly people park closer um, and they can. That's just what we have to use when determining how much parking is lost. Because I'm just curious who, who came out and looked and determined that they were going to take the spots, those spots. Like, did you ever realize that there's no parking for anybody there? And most of the people on Aspen Street park on Montrose Street. And it pushes the people who live on Montrose Street over to other streets. And also now that there's a development on the corner at 63 Moreland on your map there, you have people coming down either side of, Mo of Moreland Street, making the left down Montrose Street or right as a one way and cutting in their driveway because their Moreland Street properties driveway is on Montrose Street. So instead of going, them going down around Copeland Street and coming up Aspen and making a right into their driveway off Montrose, they're just making a right or a left right off of Moreland Street, coming up a one way to dip into their driveway, which is dangerous. We have kids playing. You don't even know when the cars come in. I've approached the people and they say, oh, we didn't know, but yet they live there. So how can they not know? So I, I think you really need to think about it because it's getting pretty dangerous over here with the density of that project on 63 Moreland Street. So your uh, question touches two things that we constantly are in battle about is preserving parking 
for people in the neighborhood and actually making a safe space so that people's children don't feel threatened as they're moving about through the neighborhood. Uh, taking away this parking provides line of sight to let people see people trying to use the corners and cross the street. Um, and that's really the only answer to provide the line of sight that you need to see a person crossing the street. So if we want increased safety, we do have to take some amount of parking. We do everything we can to make that number as small as possible. And we're going to continue to refine the design to make that number as small as possible as we continue to go. But you don't get safety without parking restrictions at corners. So some parking has to come out to get any amount of increased safety. And that's just how it works. And that's just the, the facts that we have to work with there. Um, so it's not okay. up to me to decide all those things, but those are, that's, that's where we okay. are. I understand that, but could you consider taking less than 20 feet? 20 feet is uh, basically the absolute minimum that we can go to on these corners uh, in this city. That is, that is the lowest that we can go and still feel that it is safe. Yeah, I um, think just the one other thing is that I, 20 feet is also just the design standard that is applied to a lot of different, whenever these street design changes are proposed, um, you know, it's not like 60 feet um, is an automatic, it's, we're just saying 20 feet because that's sort of what um, the city is approved. Um, or has considered the standard sight line distance. All right, uh, Lorraine, you are unmuted and up next. So, um, so we're saying right now where Cheryl lives on that corner by removing 20 feet, that would remove one parking spot from Montrose Street, right? Because you can only park on that on one side of the street anyway. Yes. Yeah, and so now my next question is the other issue that um, Cheryl brought up is people who enter Montrose Street in the wrong direction and people enter Phelan Street in the wrong direction. It's not as much as um, what was described on Mount Pleasant Ave, but people do in fact do that. So I guess we're just uh, wondering or asking, um, is there anything that would uh, make that, uh, you know, if people are going to break the law, they're going to break the law. But <laughs> if, um, is there anything that uh, makes that more prominent? Sure. Or, um, yeah. I mean, I'll, I can, I'll give me to give you two answers. You're not really going to like either of them. Um, <laughs> but I just want to be honest with you. So answer one, uh, to stop people from doing that is to shut down the street completely. You don't let cars on it. It doesn't happen. <laughs> Nobody wants that one. Um, the only other way to stop people from driving the wrong way is to have uh, enforcement on that corner 24-7. Um, we can't get enforcement there 24-7. We can't do enforcement as part of our design. It's not something that we can plan for that will always be there. It's not a safe thing that we can put in. So right. the answer is we can't stop people from going the wrong way. We can just, the designs we give them are what we can do to make it I can put up signs to tell them it's the wrong way so they know that they're not doing it correctly, but without shutting down the street or having a cop on the corner 24 seven. You do you have do better signs, bigger signs? I mean, again, I think it signs. will reduce a couple of, uh, it won't reduce a few people, but you know, the real um, people that don't want to follow it are going to sure. do it anyway. We so can, that's what I would, you could consider bigger signs, better signs. Um, I can certainly look at the placement of the signs and make sure that they are very visible um, for people so that anybody who's doing it knows that they're doing it incorrectly um, oh. and that it is not, that it is obvious that this is not the correct movement and anybody that's doing it is just somebody who, who knows that they're doing it incorrectly. All right, thank you. Yeah, and I would just add one more thing. Um, what was the key focus here, the key design change is not the parking removal or restrictions in front of the crosswalk, but the raised intersections. So maybe I didn't explain that better, but a raised intersection is like a speed hump and the crosswalk combined. So the raised intersection often 
is more effective than just signage because people do have to slow down. Um, whereas for signage, um, you know, we can put all the signs we want, but if people decide that they're not going to obey them, then they're not effective. Or if, um, if we don't have 24 seven enforcement, right? So the raised intersection is supposed to use street design to self-enforce slower speeds um, at all times. All right, uh, next question, Carl. Uh, sorry, I didn't click the unmute. Uh, you now should be able to. Uh, hearing hey, not, oh. Am I am yep. I on now? Okay, we can hear you now. Hi, um, hey guys. I think that you you know what, I wouldn't want to have to have to have your job. I think it's a tough job because, you know what, trying to promote safety and make everybody happy is almost next to impossible. You can't have it both ways. You can't have parking. You can't have directional, and and have safety. All, which you can, but you know being human nature, what it is that people are gonna do what they wanna do. I don't wanna bring this up, but I think it may be the time to bring it up because we're discussing Moreland Street and Winthrop Street and what have you. Um, I don't go out evenings. You know what, when you reach my age, nobody likes to drive at nights. <laughs> but the past two months being warmer weather, I've had the opportunity to go out at, in the evening and I go up Whiting and on to Moreland to go out to, to Warren. And I don't use Winthrop because Winthrop, that end of Winthrop Street before you get to Moreland is nothing but pothole city. And it's just, it's narrow and it's potholes. So I, it's easier for me to go up Whiting and out to Moreland. The two times that I have been on Moreland as I approach Cleveland, and right after Cleveland, if you're familiar with Moreland, <clears throat> is a bend in the street. The both times that as I approach there, there have been car accidents there. And it's just, it's uncanny because it's been, it's been both times. So to the point that when there's an accident there, you have no, no choice but to stop and get out of your car because people are fighting about whose fault it is or whatever and they're waiting for the police or what what have you and um one night waiting for because i couldn't back down the street you can't go down cleveland street it, it just because the accident was right there um a neighbor came out of his house and said this happens constantly so I don't know if you guys are aware that that curve in Moreland Street with you know, du two directions is really a, is causing a problem. More so that I will say, since I lived here, I've seen an increase of cars parked on that end of Moreland Street, because I think you know just the, the density in the neighborhood has grown. And um, that turn is really dangerous. It's sort of like a you know, blind spot. And I can see why the accidents happen. So I, I just wanna bring that up because you're discussing Moreland Street and not, you know, I don't know if you're aware of it or if anybody's contacted. Uh, we, we are, um, people have contacted us. Uh, Hannah and I have been around the neighborhood and we've seen uh, how dangerously people take that turn. Um, Without taking parking, we really have two options here, both of which um, we are going to try and implement. First is speed humps. These speed humps are designed to get people down to 20 yeah. miles an hour that will slow people in the area. We can't put one directly on the curve because you yeah. need to have line of yeah. sight, but we can put them right before and after. Um, the second, which we're going to try and do is put the double yellow center line on there. Now this doesn't slow anybody down the double yellow yeah. center but it does inform people where they should be as they're going around the corner yeah so it makes it less likely for accidents to happen because people know which side of the double yellow center that they're supposed to be on there isn't one there right now so when people are kind of 
taking yeah, gets, the corner. It gets feet, very narrow. Around, it it gets up. real. It gets very very narrow when you go around that. You know, especially when there's cars parked there. Yes. It's, it's, and it just seems like people don't want to slow down, and then you get in these accidents, or you know, this sideswiping each other. It's just um, okay. So those both of those will help with that scenario. Yeah. The only other option after that is to take away parking to increase the line of sight. Obviously, people have issues with taking away parking. This will do a lot to increase the safety around the corner. So that's not yeah. a direction that we really want to go. Yeah. Um, I'm confident yeah. that with the double yellow center and the speed humps, you will see a reduction in, in crashes around that corner. Yeah, OK, so that's cool. So the other thing I want to say, once again, being um, you know seasonal and we're outside more right now working in yards. The this is what you you do know already, and it used to be just cars coming up um, Greenville, coming down Winthrop, and then cutting up Whiting. Recently, I don't know what the uptick is or why this is, but they're coming down. They're coming up um, Greenville, coming down Winthrop, and going all the way to Fallon Street to take a right. And I don't know what that uptick is, where they're going after they hit Phelan Street. I don't know why. Well, they're doing both. And the other night we watched, we were out here, you know, I was with my neighbors and we were just talking and we couldn't believe, we thought it was gonna be a head on crash because people are going the right direction down Winthrop. And then you got the other people going in the wrong direction, both trying to make a right onto Whiting at the same time. It's crazy. It's, ab it's absolutely like like mayhem out here. So it's, it's like, I hear you guys, about you know some of the proposals you did for that you're offering for Winthrop Street, and I think that you do know the biggest problem for Winthrop Street is that you have three streets entering Winthrop, but nothing able to go out to um, you know like if for example what I mean to say is that if you are you know, we have the um, Jehovah Witness um, Hall here. And now that their COVID is sort of over, they're back practicing. And once again, you've got that problem with a large organization with that many people having to enter Winthrop, a one way from Blue Hill. And then when they exit, it's the same thing. They have to go out, out to Whiting to exit because you, you can't get from Winthrop out to any, it's just- So I, I think I have the answer to your, to your question here. Um, so I, I had previously talked about this with the wrong ways on Montrose Street, where if we don't do anything to the street direction over here, I can't do anything to stop people from driving the wrong way besides put up signs so that they 100% fully know that they're going the wrong way. Uh, one of the options that Hannah talked about earlier um, would be switching the directions of Cleveland and Whiting. So doing that would create a circle of Winthrop, Cleveland, Moreland, Whiting, and that lets people go around the neighborhood in the correct direction. So you get less people um, driving the wrong way. This is option one on this screen right here. Right. The only thing that comes up when that happens is now there is a legal cut through through the neighborhood. And I can't tell you what will happen to the amount of traffic in the neighborhood. This will stop the wrong way driving. But now this gives people coming down Greenville a legal option to go, you know, Greenville, Cleveland, Moreland to wherever right. they right. want. So I don't I'm not going to be the person to make that decision for your neighborhood. Um, this is, do you want a, some amount of wrong way driving or do you want a potential cut through and no wrong way driving so that you understand which way right. the vehicles are going? So I have to tell you, when I first moved here, Cleveland Street was a two way. Then without any discussion, all of a sudden it became a, a one way. And instead of it being out to Moreland, they turned it into Winthrop. And, and, and I don't even know who, where, why. It was never discussed amongst the residents. And it just one, one morning you, we came by and it's, it's now a one way. Wow. And I don't even know where or what that, how that happened, which caused more of a bottleneck in a, in a 
more of a speeding because it's um, Greenville, you know, they, they speed up to Greenville and then now that they can just, you know, continue down Winthrop. And, and it's not even they're going to Whiting now, they're going to Fairland. And it just doesn't make, and here's, here's, here's what I'm really Carl, afraid Carl, about. I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I do want to cut you off. Um, I do want to keep listening to your questions, but I want to make sure we get to everybody else's first. Yeah, okay. Um, so you that. can raise your hand again and we'll come back to you. I just no, want to make no, sure. But I, I guess, I, I think you got my message. I, I did. Um, you know, anybody, please look at this. If one of these options speaks to you, please make sure that you, um, you say so either in the chat or raise your hands to to tell us. Um, uh, Dan, Stephanie. while while we're here, just there was another question in the chat specifically about Cleveland Street and if um, we had considered the width of Cleveland Street and thinking about any of these proposals. Um, yes. Uh, sorry, you said Cleveland Street. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Cleveland Street is very narrow. Um, it comes in somewhere around 20 feet, maybe a little bit less for parts of it. So the only way that we can legally make it two way now is again, taking away parking, um, which people don't like, people don't wanna do. Um, that's not to say we can't do it, but generally that option does not fly in neighborhoods is taking away parking for the entire length of a street. So the best options are to go somewhat, uh, choose one of the one ways that preserves all of the parking and gets you your what you're looking for. So that would be looking at option one, which reverses Cleveland and Whiting. Um, option two, that only reverses Cleveland, um, which makes it a little bit more difficult to circulate within the neighborhood. Um, or option four, which changes Winthrop to two way. Yeah, and I'm just gonna go to Sarah right now to ask the question. Great. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, first reiterating what Carl said at the beginning. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time to review all this with us. It's clearly a lot of work. Um, I work in an operations team and I know what it feels like to present to an impassioned team of people um, when you know you have to make a hard decision on you know what to do to, to, to get a right outcome. So thank you guys so much. I realize it's late also. Um, my, I have two questions. So one, Mine was specific to Cleveland uh, Street one. Totally agree, it's really narrow. Unless there's no parking, I don't even see how it could possibly be two ways. Um, I didn't live here when it was um, two ways and I don't know if maybe the other direction is a better direction. I can't really say. Um, I think there've been some pretty compelling arguments as to why it could be. But I think my question about there being speed humps was just like, can we first just try to like, decrease the amount of speeding down that one way that happens. Cause the reality is, is like everyone's saying, people driving down one ways happens beyond just Roxbury, right? It's all over the world. Um, so like, how do we mitigate that? Which then sort of got me thinking about the next piece. Like I've never been anywhere in Boston where I've seen such awful speeding in a neighborhood. Like I, I can hear it when I'm in my apartment, people just speeding down the road. And I do think, I know um, it was mentioned like we can't have 24 seven police like detail here. Of course not, that's ridiculous to even think is possible, but like, can there be some level of enforcement here that's like increased over a period of time, maybe like the summer or something. Um, like if people knew like you would regularly get a ticket if you speed on these streets, maybe it'll decrease over time. Um, I just, yeah, I, I don't see any of these things outside of like putting physical barriers on the street actually changing how people are going to drive especially people who have lived here for a long time and they've just gotten used to driving in a certain direction right like I, whether that's right or wrong i don't know but um yeah those are just a couple of things i was thinking also because like i live right outside of cleveland our driveway entrance is right there i am just waiting for the day someone's pulling out because the way people speed down the street like they're not even looking i'm waiting for the day someone gets hit so i'm just yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about this area in general, and I'm, I'm curious if anyone has thought beyond some of these proposals, which I appreciate very much. Um, I think your question really boiled down to, um, can we do something with enforcement? Um, yeah, that, is that basically. Correct? I didn't, I didn't plan coming into this call. I, I was really gonna push for the speed humps on Cleveland because okay. like, I, I don't think it's big enough for two-way. And I don't know which direction is better, 
I think hum- like speed humps are just going to improve people driving down really fast. But yeah, if, if we can just have a bunch of people getting tickets on these streets, I, maybe people will slow down. I don't know. Yep. Um, I, that does, so that does help for a period of time. Um, when that happens, people stop doing it. And when the ticketing eventually stops, people start doing it again. Um, I can't promise any enforcement. Um, the, the police department is entirely separate and we have no control really over what they do. Um, so I can't promise that as a solution. I can just look at street safety solutions for these things. And I understand that a lot of people want enforcement, but I just totally, I can't, I can't give you that. Um, as I, totally get it. I know we're low on time. So just an in interest of that, yeah, okay. but is the speed humps like something we'd consider on Cleveland? Cause again, I really don't think. Changing yeah. The I just, I yeah. just want to go back to the speed humps um, map real quick because most of the streets in this neighborhood, um, as people have asked for, we are considering for speed humps. Um, when I say considering, I just mean that we don't have the exact locations yet for all the speed humps. But um, that is the tool that as Boston Transportation Department, we have the ability to um, use to slow speeds and yeah, they have been effective and in other neighborhoods where we've installed them. As awesome. Some people I'm so sorry. I just realized we're up on time and I don't want to. But okay. how do we know when it will be approved and the timeline around it? Is it just this is a recurring call and we just have to sort of wait to figure out when it's going to happen? Or um, Our gold construction date is fall 2023. 20, ah, so okay. next year. Um, right. And I, yeah, I'm just going to go to Herschel next. But thank you. Yeah, no, thank you guys again. Really appreciate it. No problem. All right, Herschel, you're you're up. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, first to Dan, uh, I want to apologize for missing our 15 minute session earlier at um uh, earlier this evening, I was out on the road and I, I rescheduled, but we may can cancel it based on. No, it's uh, it's tomorrow, Herschel. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, at five is o'clock. oh oh okay. All right. <laughs> well, then it's still on then. But here's two suggestions, and I'm, I'm what the common denominator I'm hearing is traffic, uh, parking, parking, traffic, parking, parking, traffic. One option. Well, there are a lot of options, but my option is. And I've suggested it several years ago before the city came to involve our neighborhood into these discussions about speed humps. People park on Mullen Street and they park on Whiting Street and they park on Copeland Street to go to their jobs. I've always been a advocate for residential parking in our community here. They have it in residential parking in areas like Brookline, Newton, and other places. You can't just go there and park. You will get ticketed or you'll get towed. So we can, if we can in, think about and, 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 and look at residential parking only, that might cut the curse down on the cars, number of cars on these streets. Suggestion number two. In that curve on Mullen Street, now I'm born and raised on Mullen Street for you know 47 years. Okay. I have seen more cars total at Whiting and Mullen than I have in that curve. I'm not discrediting what other people see and saw, but as a resident on the street, I may have seen maybe a couple accidents in that curve. But I respect the people that have a concern for that. I have a concern too. Uh, mostly it's people that just don't know how to, how to uh, navigate in that curve. So too much is better than not enough. Can we take a look at the even side of the street, that curve there where the sidewalk is and see if that sidewalk is too wide for the area? Because if you take a foot off of it, 
it would it would it would cut down on a lot of playroom that you have when you're coming through there on the outside curve. Suggestion number three, in regards to the new 63 Mall, 63 uh, Mullen Street there, the new house that they just built. These people are moving from other areas of the state and they're coming to live in this street. And I think if we approach this clerically, meaning a notice is sent to the residents in the house saying, we are about our, this community is about safety and we try to obey the law. Please do not use this street as a throughway from Mullen Street to get to your driveway. And that's, those are my suggestions for those three issues. Okay, um, thank you. Was there any particular answer you wanted there or was it just the suggestions? There were suggestions, but if, if you can give me a quick rebuttal on those. Sure. I, I can you know, certainly do that. Um, one, it sounds like your neighborhood association, according to Lorraine, has submitted an application for residential parking. Um, I know the city seems like a monolith um, and it's something that maybe I could do, but I don't, I don't get to make that decision. Um, I got to be honest, I'm not even 100% sure where that decision goes to. I'm sure my boss, Stephanie, does. Um, Two, uh, widening the streets um, will not help um, going around that corner. Almost universally, widening a street invites faster speeds and will not increase the amount of tra or crashes there, but it will definitely not decrease it. Um, having a wider street just leads to more crashes because people can drive faster. And your third one was about a private residential driveway, I think. And I don't get to tell them where to put their driveway, unfortunately. No, no, I wasn't saying where to put the driveway, but from, unless I misunderstood what the conversation was, people I mean, are coming I, okay. down Wallen and they're making a right on that street. Oh, to, to go the wrong, to go the wrong way. Eg exactly. Right, right, I see what you're saying. Um, correct. Um, so that's, the discussion we had earlier about the the wrong way driving on um on those streets um which is the information i gave before which is either shut the street down or the enforcement which i don't i don't unfortunately get to be a part of um and most people don't like the idea of shutting the street down to traffic completely uh which is unfortunate um and that that just is the answer um, so, uh, with that, I'm going to move on. Carl, I see your hand is back up. I just want to go to a couple other people who I haven't heard from yet and we'll come back to you. Uh, Alicia, uh, I believe you are next. Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. Awesome. So I just have a couple more comments. This is not, um, in regards to the streets we're talking about, but, um, you mentioned in your presentation about Waverly turning into a one-way. And then I also want to uh, ditto the previous person in terms of getting residential parking, um, because on, for example, Waverly, we're getting a new development. It's not finished yet, but there, there will be underground parking. But I mean, you can imagine just with the new residents, there's going to be quite a bit of parking um, and Waverly's already sort of cramped. So I, 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 it would be helpful if you guys could at least point us in the right direction in terms of how to get residential parking throughout the neighborhood, because I do think that will help. Um, and in terms of Parent Street, my, my vote, I guess, because you guys showed the several options, would be to keep um, Perrin a two-way between Alaska and Waverly, and then keep it a one-way the remainder of the street. So I just wanted to say that, I guess, again, um, I've had the one-on-one -on -one meeting, but just to kind of, you know, reiterate that, and I don't know if anybody else on here is, you know, on Parent or Waverly, but I think that would be just the best option in terms of traffic and safety so great just, right. that's all yeah. i want to um i'll take that dan um so one um yes so i know we did talk about this so waverly street actually we're not considering to change the direction of the street um the consideration for waverly is just to add speed humps um as far as keeping Waverly to Alaska Street two-way, um, that is something we can consider. I think the one issue is that if there are issues with two-way driving right now, 
um, that with parked cars on both sides, that could remain an issue. And the only way we'd be able to, to stripe a double yellow line on that street is if parking was restricted on both sides of the street. Um, because when we add a double yellow line, we need to maintain um, certain street widths on both, um, tr both directions. Yeah, I know. I'm so, just, in terms yeah. of accessibility, right? There's like several, or there's a few houses between Alaska and Waverly. So if you make the whole street one way, there is, you're essentially the people on sort of the, I don't know what direction it is, but on the bottom part of Waverly, they only have one way to get to their house, as well as the people on that part of Karen, whereas Alaska feeds in straight from Blue Hill. So I think in terms of like a convenience thing, you're basically saying that the people who live in that area can only access their house through Warren Street. Um, and so that's why my suggestion is to keep, a, yeah. keep that little area both ways. So you can, those people both on the south part of Waverly, as well as on Parent Street can have actually access to their house via Blue Hill. So okay. that's my suggestion. I mean, that's all I wanted to say. I didn't, I didn't need a response. I just wanted to like, once again, reiterate my suggestion and like, you know, I know you guys are going to make the decision at some point, but I do think in terms of like, um, like, I think you have a lot to consider. So I'm not like jealous of your position, but that is my, my uh, suggestion living on Perrin right now. And, and I'm one of the houses in between Alaska and Waverly. So. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. We can consider yeah. that. Uh, all right, on to uh, Aline. Uh, there we go. Um, hello, everybody. Um, this is Aline from Council Anderson's office. I just um, heard a couple of things that I may be able to at least um, help or check in with um, that I wanted to like inform everybody. You can call our office um, about the residential parking. From what I've heard from them so far, is that they have no timeline for when they will be reopening the process. Um, but if you had an application already in for residential parking before uh, COVID, please reach out to us. We can um, definitely um, look into it and see where in the process it was. Um, so typically you would uh, complete an application. It would go to the mayor's office to ONS and ONS would put it through a community process. And after that, they would send it out to the appropriate uh, department within transit. But um, right now they're saying that that application process is closed. Um, our office is um, continuously um, trying to continue uh, to have communications with them about um, them setting a timeline. So I'm able to bring back that information to the community. But um, I, I would definitely suggest that you contact our office, um, even with the whole uh, speeding thing and having uh, more police presence. Uh, that's definitely something that we can reach out to the um, community service um, office for be, uh, for for the um, area. Um, they have been doing like the Nubian walk with us and um, trying to engage our office a lot. So that's definitely something we can uh, speak to them about. Um, I would just encourage, I'm gonna write my email and our phone number in, um, in the chat. Um, I would definitely, encourage folks to please uh, reach out to us. Um, we can definitely try to facilitate communication um, between um, constituents and uh, residents. And uh, definitely we've been dealing a lot with the residential parking. I know that that's a, that's a big want from the community. And there are a couple of streets I know that right now we're checking into Alaska Street um, that's also in that area. Um, and I, I believe there's one more, I just can't remember the, the name, but please, um, check in with our office and we can definitely try to at least point you to the right um, in the right direction or um, reach out to the right to appropriate person to um, try to get some answers okay thank awesome. you thank you that was very helpful um, with a lot of the questions that i did not know the answer to um on to doreen hi I don't live directly on these streets, but I'm two streets over from Waverly. Um, Clifford and Woodbine have the same problem as Waverly, um, if not worse for, um, for Woodbine, since it's one of the first after Martin Luther King to go back to Blue Hill. It's a cut through for everybody. So what I'm wondering is, I have two questions. 
um, how were Clifford and Woodbine left off this design? And when you talk about speed humps, do you have to do the bump outs in order to have the speed humps? Because what I heard would happen over by Moreland, Fairland, um, way, um, and the streets over there is that they would lose parking on already tight streets. So in some of the neighborhoods where speed humps have been put in, they haven't put the bump outs. So is it possible to do the humps and not the bump outs and save some of the parking? Um, I can take that last question so we don't lose it. Um, so the speed humps um, are a little bit different than what you're seeing here. Um, the, in 3D, this would be, you would see intersections where the crosswalks are slightly raised. So instead of just one, one small speed hump that goes across the street, all of the crosswalks are the same height as the um, sidewalk. So it's called a raised intersection. And when you're driving on a car, in a car, um, you'll feel that slight, um, a gradual hump. So it will, it will encourage people to drive slower. The curb extension, the only curb extension that is right here is at Copeland Street and Moreland Street. And the, um, Dan, please chime in um, if you, there's anything I miss no, out, I can, but or, sorry, it's essentially to slow the turns from Moreland Street to Copeland Street, which is what we heard um, was a concern of people speeding from along that turn. So when I'm looking at your diagram, it shows the, at the corner of Fairland and Moreland that with the raid sidewalk in the intersection that you will lose 20 feet of parking on a street that's already parking congested. So yes. I've put up on the screen a picture of a raised intersection in Cambridge so you can better understand what we're talking about. So um, oh, no, I, I understand I'm asking about is there a way to adjust that? So I, I am trying to explain to you why it's designed this way. So the crosswalk is up at the height of the curb. We have to use some amount of space to bring the roadway up to that level. It can't be really um, steep um, because then we would damage vehicles. And that's not what we're going for. We're going for um, easy, slow speeds through here. So in addition to the crosswalk itself, which you can never park on, um, we also, you can't park on this um, piece here that is coming down. And then there's a few more feet after that. So it's 20 feet from this crosswalk line. It's not 20 feet from back here. Um, so I understand your concern, but this is the way that we design streets. And this is like a standard visibility that we need in order to put in crosswalks um, for safety by parks. Uh, great. On to Brian. Uh, one of my questions oh, did not get answered. Oh, sorry. Um, can you remind me? Who decided, me? Hannah, why is the zone, the streets, why, are, what's, why do we decide what streets are in the zone and which ones aren't? So the neighborhood social street, in 2018, we, there was an application process and um, the neighborhood, uh, part of the application process was to submit boundaries for um, the slow zone um, and we asked neighborhood associations to submit boundaries. So we, we hear that there is speeding on every street in Boston. And unfortunately there are boundaries within um, that we need to draw in order to complete projects within a certain timeline. Um, so just because Clifford isn't considered right now for speed homes doesn't mean that it will never, that it's ruled out. Um, it's just right now for this project, we're talking, we already covered so many different areas and streets right now. So. 
Um, that is a short answer, but you're welcome to send me an email um, and we can talk more about that. Okay, so yeah. Um, Dan, do you wanna pass it on to the next person? Sure, uh, Brian, uh, we'll get you and then we'll get back to people who have, who briefly still ask questions. Uh, oh, I lost Brian. All right, you should be able to unmute now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first, I've known Josh McBadden for a long time. The person who's in there as Josh McBadden, I don't think that's him. He's uh, just doesn't seem like him. But I wanted to ask about Mount Pleasant Ave. I live on Mount Pleasant and I arrived late, so I apologize, I didn't see. Do you mind if I take a look at the slides that represented the potential changes for Mount Pleasant? Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to review them very quickly and then I'll just make a comment based on what I see. But I apologize for having me do it again. Yeah, so um, the challenge here, um, first, the safety concern is that people are driving the wrong way from Vine, between Vine Street and Bradley Street. And you're not sharing your screen if you're trying oh, to. Oh, I'm right sorry. Now. That's okay. Um, and the challenge with addressing that with street design tools um, is that we do have to maintain certain width um, for emergency access um, and also that they're limited, uh, street design tools are sort of limited in their ability to address behavior like wrong way driving. Um, we can do our best, but sometimes when people are committed to driving the wrong way, then it's hard to discourage that. Um, our, what we can like put our minds together and kind of proposed as maybe a solution is to make the street, make that move from Vine Street to Fairland legal, but safer by making it more predictable by adding a double yellow line to the divide the two travel lanes um, so that it's clear that someone is driving eastbound in one lane and westbound in the other and they're not going to um, and it will prevent head-on collisions or discourage head-on collisions um, but this would mean restricting parking um, sorry this is actually this is the one. Um, this would, meet, would mean restricting parking between Vine Street and Fairland Street, um, which might not be popular. Actually, Dan, do you want to get more? Do you want to add more about? Uh, I'll just do emergency it quick because I don't want to okay. spend too much on this. Um, so yeah, so the first one here is potentially doing two way here. We are listening back and forth about people's what they want to do. Um, uh, the second option, the second things that we're looking for is um, some bump outs on either end of Mount Pleasant Street um, at either end of Forest Street, where we're looking to add crosswalks um, and restrict some parking to make those crosswalks safe, um, as well as a raised crosswalk to the playground at, um, the name is escaping me, uh, the Mount Pleasant play area. Um, and that just gets a safe crossing to the uh, to the park. Yeah, right. But I think Brian was asking specifically about this. Um, if I'm if I'm correct about the our proposal between Vine Street and Fairland Street. Um, Sorry, Brian. Why don't you, uh, with all of that, would you like to weigh in so we can just want to see if you had another question with that information? I guess. Can you please unmute him, Dan? Oh, sorry. Yep, one sec, Brian. Thank right. you. Sorry, I always go back on mute after that's I'm done speaking. Right. That's, that's helpful. Um, Thank you. So I actually, you know, when I was first thinking about how to solve the issue of the wrong way driving and stuff like that, this was actually the idea that I thought of. After <laughs> a lot of contemplation, I, you actually mentioned it on another change about one of the streets on the Copeland area that if we make this a legal um, turn, it's just going to invite a lot more traffic 
And with a lot more traffic coming through the narrow street, it's just going to create an issue where we'll have more vehicles coming through. It won't be more safe. It'll probably be less safe. I so don't think, I think, we, he's kind of, I think yeah. he said it a couple of times. I don't think there is a good solution mm -hmm. here besides, you know, enforcement. Yeah. So I just want to be clear. We actually have done quite a bit of analysis to understand the potential impacts of allowing traffic through the neighborhood in the way that it seems to want to flow. Um, it's not necessarily like tens of thousands of vehicles. These streets aren't going to get a lot more people. You will see more people because it will be an option that doesn't exist today. Um, not just people who are going through the neighborhood, but also people who maybe live sort of in the southern part of this neighborhood, right? So instead of going all the way around to get in, maybe they'll take fine to Fairland instead. So there is an increase that's likely, but it's not something that is so intense that we would be nervous about recommending, you know, a potential option that allows it. Um, combined with the other measures that we're planning for speed humps, um, you know, the idea would be that Yes, you will see another car every minute, maybe coming through the neighborhood, um, but it is not, uh, they would be still going slower than they are today. Um, and with some of these design changes, it would be more predictable and therefore more safe as Hannah said. Um, the, the analysis is, you know, our best guess based on the best information we have, which is still very vague. So it's not like we we know for sure that people are gonna change their routes. We just suspect that based on how people are moving through the general area today, that you will see you know, another vehicle per minute in the peak hour. Okay. Um, Carl, you've been waiting to get called on again. Uh, you're back up. Um, you should be able to unmute. Carl, are you still there? Hey, I'm I'm muted now. Oh, yep. So, Dan, could you explain the diagram for number four picture for Winthrop Street again? I really couldn't um, see can it. Can you pull that one up, please? So I, before you bring it up, I just can I just tell you what my observation and my see my next door neighbor is here. What we see on Withrop Street is the um, amount of cars that are from like 630 to 830 in the morning who take Winthrop Street to get out to go up like um, Whiting to get out to Warren and they're avoiding lights if you try to use Moreland. So it makes more sense. If, you're, if you've got to be at work at eight o'clock and you're, you're running late, you're going to take Winthrop Street so you can get out to Dudley real fast. You're going to take Winthrop so you can get out to Warren real fast without taking Moreland that you're going to have to have lights on either end. So saying that, I want you to realize that is the hour that the kids are walking to the Dearborn. How there has not been a kid killed because cars are speeding. What happens, they come down Winthrop, they get to Fielen Street to the stop sign, and then it's an open dragway right out to, to, um, to Dudley Street if you take Greenville. Something has to be done. So I'm hoping that that picture number four is can you explain that picture for for an option for Winthrop? Sure. Um, so four is just turning Winthrop Street between Cleveland and Fairland to two way. So right. this is to make that so, okay. Illegal. So that's good. So Dan, if you come down Winthrop from Cleveland, you would have to take a right on to either Whiting or on to um, Fearland, is that what you- I'm um, sorry, say that again. So if you're coming from either up Greenville or from Cleveland and you're coming down Winthrop, you would have to take a right onto Whiting 
or would you continue it to take you could, a right? You could go to Fairland with this option. You could go to Fairland. Yes. Okay, so that would stop the cars from speeding in the morning from, you know, as I say, from Blue Hill without it hitting a traffic light, which I think would be much safer. It also would give you the, you know, we have three churches right in that kind of a short strip too of um, people want to come and go. Now the church people are not like what we see in the morning time. You've got to realize that in the morning time is people racing to work or wherever they're going to. Yep. And, so we, we will be adding speed humps to this street and that should significantly help cut down on the speeding there. Um, won't stop the one way, but it will slow no, them down. No, but Dan, I think, the, I think option four is much better because you have no street that feeds into Winthrop. They're all like one ways going out of Winthrop. You have no st street feeding into Winthrop other than Cleveland. And it's really, Cleveland really isn't on Winthrop Street. It's at the intersection of the other end of Winthrop and Greenville. So do you know what I'm saying? So you don't have a street that feeds in. So I think that option four would probably be the best from what I can make a, a, out of it. And, and, and I, I see my neighbor Barry's here. I, I, I would hope that Barry would, would have something to say because he lives right next door to me. He sees it sure. also. Um, and we do look at all of this chat too. So if you, anybody in the chat or here sees these, please write in the chat if you don't want to talk, which options you like that helps us figure out what the neighborhood really wants. So I do hear you, Carl. I just want to make sure we hear thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come up again, Jim. No problem. All right, we got one last question. It's eight o'clock. Uh, Lorraine, uh, you are up. So hi, let's see. Hi, I just wanted to say that um, as some people have mentioned on the call, we have a huge project that's at 280 Warren Street. And right now it's um, impacting Clifford Street, which isn't part of your plan. But because the street is one way out to Warren, and that's where the garage is. And then there's housing on Waverly Street. So I, I guess I'm saying it's a moving target sort of right now. So I don't know how you do that, but you've got to coordinate with those developers that are building those projects so that, um, you know, the streets aren't closed down for long and, you know, people are able uh, to get around. So yeah, I just thought will, I would share that. We will definitely make sure we are coordinating our construction with other work in the area. Thank you. No problem. Okay, um, that's all the hand raised. Uh, hand it off to you, Hannah, to take us home. Yes, okay, thank you. So thanks. For bearing with us, we know that um, it's difficult to have really in-depth conversations virtually. And um, as I said, we plan to have more pop-up informal, in-person um, uh, meetings or gatherings in the neighborhood so that folks who can't join virtually can still share and learn more information. Um, just wanted to put the timeline on the screen. Um, I said fall 2023 earlier for goal construction, but basically any time between summer and fall of next year is our goal to get things started in the ground. Um, and we just wanted to thank everybody who has been part of this process or um, has come to a meeting or shared feedback. We really took all of your concerns really um, seriously and still invite more. So um, I'm just gonna close it out for tonight because I know we have lots of things to get to, but this is our contact information if you would like to speak with me more. So thank you everyone. And we're gonna share the materials to everyone who shared, participated in the meeting tonight and also through our email list. All right, thank you guys.